Things are always interesting when you have a mixture of both genders in a place. Why do you think college parties are always the bomb? But I think we can all agree that there are a few places where having different genders together unearths a lot of issues. And a prison is one of them. But are mixed gender prisons really a bad idea? Do they even exist? And what crazy things are going on in them? Stick to the end of the video to find out. Samantha Orobader woman due to stand trial for drug trafficking in Laos could face death by firing squad if convicted. As ironic as this may sound, what saved this prisoner's life was the fact that she was carrying someone's life inside of her. But here's the plot twist. She wasn't pregnant before she was detained, so that means one thing and one thing only. She got pregnant while she was in prison. But how did that happen when she was placed in an all-female prison? Well, to take you full circle on what transpired, we have to go back to how it all started during a summer vacation in Southeast Asia. Samantha Orabe had initially told her family in the UK where she was residing that she was going on vacation to the Netherlands in August 2008. From Amsterdam, she traveled to Thailand and then to Laos, where she was arrested after being caught with more than half a kilo of heroin. She pleaded that she had been forced to carry the drugs to Australia by two Nigerian men who had raped her, and then threatened to seize her passport and even kill her if she didn't. Now, the Laos government may make hundreds of millions of dollars from tourism every year, but they didn't take things lightly with drug traffickers and weren't about to make an exception. Attempting to smuggle as much heroin as Samantha did was enough to face execution, but given the circumstance of things, they would later reconsider letting justice be obstructed a little bit. Besides, 35,000 British tourists alone visit the nation of Laos every year. Obviously, tourism is a big source of income for the country, so having a British national on death row doesn't exactly spell welcome to our country, dear foreigner. Nevertheless, the authorities were still keen on giving Samantha capital punishment without the case going public in the international community. Samantha would escape death row quite all right, but not in the way you would imagine. She was first kept in Phong Thong Prison, a mixed prison known for housing foreigners who have been convicted of crimes in the Laos capital of Vientiane. There, she miraculously got pregnant after four months of stay. When journalists started reporting on the incident, not knowing the full story, they jumped to the easiest conclusion that they could think of, rape. It was the most logical answer, and it gained her a lot of sympathy in the eyes of the public. A pregnant woman facing a firing squad? Anybody with a heart would feel sorry for her. This put the Laos authorities in a tighter spot, and they needed to change the narrative. So, with a baby cooking in her stomach, Samantha couldn't face the death penalty because pregnant women cannot be put on death row. Figuratively, you would say she dodged a bullet, but in the literal sense of things, she stopped one from being fired her way, or at least her baby did. As for the rape case, it was later debunked, and according to Samantha, her baby's father was actually another Briton, John Watson, who was facing life for drug trafficking. But this is not the case of finding love in a hopeless place. As far as Samantha is concerned, she didn't get intimate with Watson. The man only donated his sperm to her, which she injected into her system. And as proof, a syringe was found in Samantha's belongings, suggesting she deliberately got pregnant by artificial insemination. The only way she could save her life was by creating one. It was the only move she had in her arsenal, and it had paid off. Samantha and Watson were happy for different reasons. As for Samantha, she had bought time for herself. Because Laos laws did not allow pregnant women to be put on death row, she was then convicted to life imprisonment instead. And as for John, he was just happy to be a father again. Life imprisonment had made him depressed, and being a father again lifted his spirit. With the help of the UK authorities, Samantha was transferred to the UK where she is currently serving her sentence in Holloway Prison, North London. Samantha's story is nothing short of a crazy one, but this next tale could easily be mistaken for a modern-day version of Bonnie and Clyde. Carrie and Kay Danes before Samantha's case went viral, two lovebirds had put the country of Laos and their criminal foreign nationals on world news. Carrie Danes had taken an extended leave without pay from the Australian Army after over two decades of service. He worked as a manager with his wife for Laos Securicor, a private security provider which had clientele that included the country's biggest sapphire mine, gem mining Laos, which would turn out to be the reason for their ill fate. When the original owners of the mining company Jefferson & Bruns fled the country to Thailand, they appointed Carrie and his wife as supervisors of their company. The couple probably should have taken a hint that all was not well, but they instead saw it as an opportunity to run the mining company on the advice of Carrie's lawyer. They didn't know that the owners were owing their investors a lot of money already, and worse, were already in the bad books of the government. Carrie had even gone ahead to accuse the government of corruption and greed, but even though he soon realized his mistake, things were about to become even worse for him and his wife. Two months later, Carrie was arrested for exporting sapphires, which the Lao government had deemed 
deemed illegal for the gem mining Lao Company the previous year in December 1999. Kay Danes tried to flee the country on foot with their kids the same day, only to be apprehended by police at the border between Laos and Thailand. This was far from the Christmas the Danes had planned. Their two kids were sent back to Australia, but Carrie and Kay remained detained for months in conditions that were straining not just on themselves, but also on their marriage. Married couples spend a lot of time in a lot of places, on vacations, at home with family, and some even share a workplace. But for these two, prison was somewhere they'd be spending not the most quality time together. And guess which prison they were sent to? Yep, Phan Thong Prison, same as Samantha some years later. Carrie and Kay Danes may be husband and wife who served in a mixed prison facility, but there, they were not treated like so. Communication was prohibited, which meant that they could only talk with their eyes and share a few secret whispers. Can you imagine not being able to freely interact with someone you're lawfully wedded to? And to make matters worse, restricted interaction was not the biggest problem they were facing. Living conditions were poor, dietary needs were barely met, and prisoners, as expected, usually suffered psychological deterioration as well as physical torture. I was beaten, I was threatened with mock executions, I had um, a pistol hit in the back of my head. The worst part about all of this was that they were detained for almost a year before being trialed and sentenced to seven years in prison for embezzlement, destruction of evidence, and evasion of tax. They were also asked to pay dollar AUD one million, but courtesy of the Australian government, the married couple didn't even spend up to a year in prison. The Australian Prime Minister at the time, John Howard, was convinced beyond any reasonable doubt that his kinsmen were innocent, and so he personally went into direct dialogue with the Laos government. With their seized properties returned to them, them, the Danes would soon have their lives back on track. The couple were offered a presidential pardon and sent back to Australia where they were basically freed, that is, no longer charged with anything. Kerry resumed work in the army before retiring for good, and although they were free to return to Laos, there's hardly any doubt that they would want to go back anytime soon as it took them quite a while to get over what they went through. Mrs. Danes even claims that though they are no longer in that prison, she still feels like she hasn't really left. The post-traumatic stress has been heavy on her mental state. Nevertheless, she turned her struggles into a good course and started campaigning against the harsh conditions notorious in Asian prisons, such as the Fontong prison. She also spoke up when Samantha was held up there years later. Her efforts have gained Kay a Medal of the Order of Australia, quite a happy ending to this crazy tale, one that many people can get up to speed with since Kay Danes published a memoir eight years later. Jasmine Jones We've seen crazy things happen in mixed-gender prisons. Relationships flourish, babies are made, and married inmates are forced to be strangers. But crazy things also happen in single-sex prisons. As a matter of fact, some male prisons keep female inmates, especially those that weren't born females. One such scenario occurred with Jasmine Jones. Jasmine has had a hard life, especially in her struggle for the world to accept her identity. Her mom kicked her out of the house when she came out as gay, and following her transition into female, the world still refused to see her as the woman she saw herself as. So, she made an unusual best friend. The streets. The streets were my best friend. That's where I learned to become who I am today. This is what she told CNN in 2021. She caught CNN's attention after her story of being raped and assaulted by male criminals in the prison she was held went viral. When she was incarcerated, she was sent to a male prison on the basis that she was assigned male at birth. That didn't turn out well for her. Prisons are already filled with criminals who are there because they've done some very terrible things. So with these criminals unable to terrorize society, they turned to other inmates to enact their evil deeds. And Jasmine like most transgender women was on the receiving end of such abuse. Harassment and shame for her identity were so common she had gotten used to it and there was no ounce of hope for her. Guards and prison officials did nothing about it and if she complained about her treatment, she risked getting in more trouble. Jasmine is just one of many transgender women suffering this terrible fate in prisons across America. Another person that shares in the struggle is Bambi Salcedo. She started her journey of transition when she was in her late teens, but not long after she was incarcerated for theft and other charges, she spent 14 long years enduring harassment and abuse in a male prison. She recalls being told to undress in front of men which she felt gave them the green light to carry out their heinous acts and to see trans people as lesser humans. Since Salcedo stepped out of prison, she has made it her mission to fight the justice system that has made trans women like her suffer violence from male inmates. This is one of the reasons why many have come
come out to tell their stories and why legislative actions are starting to take shape. NBC News reported that in 2015 there were 4,890 transgender inmates across the U.S., but only 15 cases could be confirmed of prisoners being kept according to the gender they identify as. That's less than 1%. The state of Texas has the largest prison population in the country, and all 980 transgender inmates are kept in prisons according to their gender assigned at birth. Now, what implications has this had on their well-being? Well, 35% of transgender inmates have reported being abused sexually. This only begs the question how many more cases are there that just aren't reported? Because as crazy as it sounds, transgender inmates do face backlash for reporting abuse, but thankfully survivors are speaking up loudly against it. Jasmine was freed in May of 2020, and Salcedo was released after 14 years. Since then, they've been at the front lines battling against the poor treatment of transgender females. Jasmine works as a legal assistant at a justice project in San Francisco for transgender folks. Bambi, on the other hand, is both the CEO and president of an organization aimed at bettering the lives of trans individuals in the country. Jasmine and uh, Bambi have chosen to fight the system that oppressed them, but it is not always easy for victims to fight back. Jenny Swift Jenny Swift was a 49-year-old trans woman who barely spent two months in an all-male prison in Doncaster. Not that she completed her sentence, but because she decided to end her life. Born Jonathan Swift, Jenny was a former British military personnel from Liverpool. Her life would turn upside down in 2016 after she stabbed 26-year-old Eric Flanagan, who died a month later in the hospital. She was charged with murder and was remanded in the male-only HMP Doncaster prison while she awaited trial in court. Because she was still receiving female hormones for her trans transition, she asked to be given meds to this effect. But the prison authorities refused her, just as they had refused her request to be transferred to a female prison or even an annex cell with trans people like her. This had thrown her into sadness, and seeing that she wasn't taking the drugs which she had been used to for three years, she began to experience withdrawal symptoms such as tremors in her legs, depression, and apathy. In addition to this, she suffered verbal abuse from other inmates and even prison officials joined in with the taunting by addressing her as Mr. But she tried to fight back by going as far as walking into jail naked and refusing to put on male clothing in solidarity with her stance. Perhaps the most brutal battle she faced was not taking her medication. This proved to be very destructive to her, both physically and mentally, as she would describe the unpleasant sensation of feeling the testosterone increase in her body. And this was countering her transitioning. The only people she felt safe around were fellow trans women in the facility. They were the only people who understood what she was going through. But despite this little support, she could only spend five weeks in remand as one fateful morning, she was found dead in her cell. From every indication, she had hung herself. This raised alarm as this was the third suicide by a transgender inmate in less than two years. Suicide is something that is common among prisoners, but sometimes some of them find a way to overcome their struggles instead of taking their own life. This next person did not only offer her voice against the injustice faced by transgenders, but she also started a cascade of events that would lead to trans women having a degree of protection. D. Farmer. Farmer had filed a lawsuit from prison that would rock the nation following the horrible things she had to endure. In 1986, Dee Farner was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment after she was charged with credit card fraud. She was originally incarcerated in a medium security federal prison in Wisconsin for men because guidelines from the federal government stated that trans inmates are kept in facilities based on their medical reports. Most times, these medical reports referred to inmates with the gender they were born with. While she was in prison in Wisconsin, she raised a lot of eyebrows from the prison officials for being a troublemaker. She reportedly smuggled in estrogen drugs, indulged in sex in the recreational yard, and underwent illegal surgery to remove her testicles. So, three years later in 1989, she was transferred to another facility that had what you could describe as more violent inmates in the U.S. penitentiary in Indiana. Here, things took a turn for the worse. Less than two weeks in, she had already suffered physical and sexual abuse at the hands of a cellmate who threatened to kill her with a knife if she didn't give him sex. Things were even more complicated because Farmer was H. HIV positive. She was subsequently transferred back to a medium security prison, but the damage had already been done. The trauma had already found a home in her mind, and she said she couldn't stop reliving the rape incident. This was a recipe for disaster. Farmer could have easily fallen into depression, or worse, taken the route of suicide. But what she did next would become a huge part of history. It would change prison reform on issues relating to abuse in prison. In 1991, Farmer filed a lawsuit called a Bivens lawsuit without a lawyer against several prison officials. It was on the grounds of violation of the Eighth Amendment. In case you're wondering what the Eighth Amendment is, it states, excessive bail ought not to be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. 
So when prison officials are indifferent and negligent to the risk of violence an inmate faces, they have violated that inmate's right to the Eighth Amendment, and that's exactly how Farmer felt. She believed the prison officials knew her safety was jeopardized by being a transgender female, but they still left her in a male facility. In the initial hearing of the trial, the court did acknowledge that prison officials have the duty to protect inmates from acts of violence outside of their judicial punishment, especially when they know certain inmates face high risks of such. Things could not have been looking any better for Farmer. This case soon became a high-profile one as it reached the Supreme Court. But unfortunately, after one year of legal deliberation, the case was dismissed on grounds of lack of sufficient evidence that she suffered the abuse she claimed especially when only one of the prison officials admitted to her being raped. After her appeal was denied, things would turn around for the better when she petitioned the Supreme Court. This is where she gained more support, especially after the America Civil Liberties Union's National Prison Project provided lawyers to help her out. This was the first case of its kind to reach the Supreme Supreme Court, and it served as a standard for many other cases just like it. But most importantly, it brought about policy change as nine years after, the PRE a bill was passed into law, which put measures in place to protect inmates. One such measure was the consideration of cases individually to determine what prison to send inmates to. Today, the name Farmer is mentioned in courts across America by lawyers anytime prison cases concerning human rights violations and sexual abuse were deliberated. Who would have thought that sending a transgender woman to a male prison would revolutionize the prison justice system. We have seen trans women suffer in male-only prisons, but what happens when a transgender male is kept in a female facility? DMI Minor. Let us now meet Demi Minor, a 27-year-old trans woman from Gloucester. She was born Demetrius to a mother, Michelle Minor, that died from a stabbing in 2004, and a father, Alajin Wright, who was charged with raping a little girl. Therefore, Demetrius became a foster kid early. However, his first foster couldn't handle him because he was notorious for getting into domestic crimes such such as carjacking and burglary. When he was 14 years old, the Butts family took him in, disregarding the warnings of his former foster parents. Then in 2011, at age 16, Demetrius was arrested and charged with the murder of his new foster father, 67-year-old retiree Theotis Butts. Demi pleaded guilty to stabbing Butts 27 times. She was sentenced to 30 years imprisonment before she would be available for parole. Now, because she was still considered male by the time she was put in jail, Demi had been sent to an all-male facility, but after some time there, she reported being abused and also announced that she was transgender and needed to be placed in a prison for females. Her lawyer, Derek DeMary, backed her, but her foster mother, Dr. Wanda Broach Butts, told journalists that she was a manipulative psychopath using transgenderism as an excuse to get advantages and attention. Wanda also noted that Demi didn't like gay people when she was growing up and never really identified or showed any sign of transgenderism. And this was a fact other people who knew Demi also confirmed. Wanda, however, stated that she has forgiven Demi for killing her husband husband and has moved on. In any case, Demi got her wish and was transferred to Edna Mahan Correctional Facility for Women. Here, things would get really interesting. Allegedly, two inmates in a New Jersey correctional facility have both become pregnant by a transgender inmate. Demi and the CIS women involved say that the act was consensual. One of her lovers, Latonia Bellamy, who was convicted of murder, said they were in a relationship and were planning to carry the baby to term. The other lady, however, reportedly forced Demi to have sex with her after threatening to harm Bellamy if she didn't. This other prisoner, whose name is not given, has reportedly aborted the baby. Nevertheless, because it was against the law to have sex in prison between inmates, Demi would later be transferred out of Edna Mahan to Garden State Youth Correctional Facility, a male facility in Burlington County. Using her website justs4demi.org, she's been speaking up against all the abuse and inhumane treatment meted out against her by prison officials and fellow inmates in her new holding. She reports attempting suicide at one point and was subsequently placed on suicide watch. Her lawyer, Demi, Mary also confirmed her state, saying, Demi is very afraid for her life and safety. Her gender dysphoria is aggravated. Her gender identity is not acknowledged and is affecting her mental health. While it isn't clear whether or not Demi is faking her gender transition for favors, the case of Tara D'Souza is totally different. Tara D'Souza Tara D'Souza is a trans woman born Adam Laboucan on October 13, 1981. He was said to have had a troubling childhood, and in 1999, at the age of 17, he was arrested and charged to court for raping a three-month-old baby he was asked to babysit. The baby had injuries that were so bad, reconstructive surgery had to be done. This crime made Adam the youngest sex offender in Canada. But before that ever happened, 
happened. When he was 11 years old, Adam drowned a three-year-old baby. Charges weren't pressed because he was underage, according to the law. Besides, people only got to know about this because he revealed it during the trial of the rape case. Such behavior for someone who wasn't even a late teen is seriously worrying, and he had to be sent to a youth containment center in Prince George, Canada. While he was held there, he indulged in self-harm by literally eating his own flesh and claimed that this was a way he calmed himself. Dr. Ian Postnikoff, who worked there as a psychiatrist, told the British Columbia Supreme Court, quote, he said he was not planning a life of crime, but he felt he had no way to control the flood of violent murderous fantasies. He also added, quote, with the history and severity of the offenses of Mr. Labukin, it's difficult to say how long his treatment would last. He's not a regular sexual offender. I would say it would be a very long time, possibly years. I would be very, very concerned to hear that Labukin would be released into the community in the near future. Anyway, during Adam's sentence, he started identifying as a woman and changed his name to Tara D'Souza. Tara also revealed that she had surgeries to this effect in 2018. And seeing that trans women usually ask to be placed in female prisons, Tara did the same and got her wish. She was subsequently transferred to Fraser Valley Institution for Women in Abbotsford. Fraser Valley Institution has several infrastructures, including a facility where mothers can live with their children and interact healthily with other female inmates. Given Tara's history, mothering inmates felt unsafe when she was around them and their children, but her presence was the least unnerving thing. She also reportedly voices inappropriate things to them, and eyewitnesses say she has been caught on several occasions looking at children in a way that doesn't show that she has good intentions. But reports say that there's more. There are also accounts of her prostituting herself and abusing other female inmates. On her profile on CanadianInmaceConnect.com, she describes herself as someone who was abused as a kid and felt it was the best thing to do. And now that she knows better, she has changed and wants someone who would not be judged judgmental, but be a good friend and maybe even more than a friend. Nevertheless, in September 2022, her appeal for parole was denied on the grounds of failed psychiatric evaluation. The evaluation results stressed that she has problems controlling her emotions, was disrespectful, uses drugs, and was still a potential menace to society. Janiah Monroe in May 2022, a 43-year-old trans female inmate who was intoxicated with alcohol was caught having sex with a younger inmate. It was two crimes in one. The first was alcohol consumption, and the second was sex between inmates. This incident happened at HMP Bronzefield, a privately run correctional center. Officers wouldn't have known about what was happening if other prisoners never reported it. Police weren't involved as prison officials wanted to contain the issue. Nevertheless, everyone was talking about it despite efforts not to let the news spread. Bronzefield is rather liberal with the way it handles its inmates. Maybe that's what led to this incident happening in the first place. As you would guess, the trans woman who was serving time for murder was taken out of Bronzefield Prison and moved to HMP Downview. The difference with Downview is that the facility has its own transgender wing. But then there's the controversial story of Janiah Monroe, who was reportedly assaulted and then was later accused of assaulting. Janiah Monroe was formally referred to as Andre Patterson. In January 2008, she was convicted of felonies ranging from second-degree murders to attempted arson and aggravated aggravated battery. She was initially placed in Pontiac Correctional Center, a male prison, but after complaining of attempting suicide and self-mutilation due to the trauma she faced from being sexually and physically abused by male inmates, she requested to be transferred. She claimed that even staff in the prison facility were harassing her, stating, I have been sexually assaulted at every men's prison that IDOC put me into, including by IDOC staff. It's time for IDOC to recognize my gender and take responsibility for keeping me safe. As long as I'm in a men's prison, IDOC can never protect me from sexual assault. She was referring to the Illinois Department of Corrections in her statement, and her lawyers also backed up her claim and proceeded to file a lawsuit in 2019 on her behalf against IDOC. Her transfer was granted, and she was headed to Logan Correctional Center. But after a while there, her story turned around completely. From complaining about being misgendered and harassed, she was accused of raping multiple female inmates. The news headlines quickly turned to transgender inmate accused of rape. She reportedly assaulted multiple inmates sexually and was said to have stopped taking her hormone drugs which indicated that she didn't want to transition anymore. However, her attorney, Alan Mills, debunked these claims and holds that the only sex she had inside the prison was consensual. There continue to be several other cases like this and they are never short of controversies. From marriages nearly turning estranged to activities ending with literal life-saving pregnancies and traumatic experiences triggering activism and prison reform. There are a lot of crazy things that go on in a prison, but which story was the craziest to you? And do you think it can top this next story in the video on on your screen, click the card and let's find out.